my name is Ashley Singh, and uh, I come from a school in Newham in London, which is called St Bonaventures. And we've booked a we've booked a play called The Day the Waters Came, and I'm here to interview the writer today. Hi, I'm Lisa Evans. I'm a playwright, and I wrote The Day the Waters Came. So, Lisa, what inspired you to write this play? I saw a BBC documentary about um, Hurricane Katrina, um, and a during which um, the, um, the documentary filmmakers were actually amazed, and so was I as an audience member, that nobody seemed to be helping the people of New Orleans. And I thought, A, I was interested in what happens with a big natural disaster, but also, what did they do about it? Okay, so you wanted to just like show the point of view from the people? That's right, I want to tell the story of the people of New Orleans. Um, while writing the play, uh, did your characters evolve in Yes, they did. I started off, um, it was uh, a very small family group, and then I realised that I'd got to widen this out to make it more universal, so I could do all of the citizens, if you like, or a snapshot of, of quite a few of the citizens. Um, during it, also Maya, who um, is the sort of central character through whose eyes we see the story, we see the, the story. She, she's our storyteller, um, she became more politicised during it. And when I first wrote it, she was just growing up and was um, aware of the changes to her and she was upset and angry about what hadn't been done but um, by the time I finished it she'd actually nailed who she thought was responsible. Uh, during Hurricane Katrina did you think the government's response was influenced by racial discrimination? Well yes because when you saw who the help went to um, and the fact that they didn't send any help for such a long time when they're a country with such enormous resources um, the National Guard actually didn't pick black people up in boats, they went past them. Um, whether it was so much entirely racial or whether it was to do with poverty, but it did seem to be that white tourists and white people got help first and that they actually, went in terms of people trying to get out of New Orleans, um, there was one bridge that was an accessible route out. There's a town on the other side of the bridge which is a principally white town and they actually had their sheriffs. Um, at the other side of the bridge and the police were stopping people coming over because they didn't want the trouble that was New Orleans, i.e. these poor people, who, most of whom were black, coming over. And I think Kanye West, who's a, who's a rapper star in, in the States, probably over here as well, he actually was heard to say on television, looking to be somewhat to his surprise as well, I don't think George Bush cares about black people. And so it wasn't just the perspective from, from this country um, that people began to think that. I think Americans thought that too. Okay. Yeah, a lot of young people are going to be watching your play. Um, what would you want them to think of after they've seen it? Um, for themselves, for starters. But um, I think there's issues that get raised by the play, as in um, country, maybe that, like America, where you, we in Britain particularly, because we share the language, we share a lot of the television programmes, a lot of young people aspire to be like Americans, sound like Americans, that's where the big film industry is, all of that. What is actually happening in terms of the lives of, of Americans? So, and also that they're a very rich country, they have huge influence in the world. Um, do their politics stand up to that? Um, so it's having a slightly critical look at some of the things we might have taken for granted, I think, otherwise. Also, they're a first world, of, pardon the phrase, but they're an affluent world country, probably the richest country in the world. Um, and yet, they couldn't actually look after their own people very well. So I question what that particular kind of government was, was was up to in terms of being democratically elected and what it actually did for its own people. Because they still haven't rebuilt housing in New Orleans, people are still living in huge poverty. The French Quarter, where the tourists go, that's fine and dandy, um, but not the bit where the uh, ordinary people live. And this happens all over the world, we see disasters, but it's like, what is, what is the truth behind the story? Okay, uh, because your play is set in a different country, um, and uh, we obviously won't have Hurricane Katrina, things like that here. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, young people will be able to relate to it easily? Um, the personal is universal, quite often, by which if you have access to something by a story of somebody that you can relate to, like um, Maya is um, a 14 year old girl, so probably the same age as in, uh, or his classmate or, or, or somebody that, that, that you would know, and her life is just going along fine and dandy in New Orleans, and one day it turns upside down. So it's about the life experience of somebody that you might know and I think if you take the emotions of somebody going through something, even if it's very different, you, emotions are universal. We all understand about love and fear and family um, and aspiration and wanting stuff and, and all the things that we surround ourselves with. Um, and apart from anything else, one of the things she 
has to acknowledge as to what's really, really important to her, because all her things, all the things that were really, really crucial to a 14-year-old girl, like her makeup and her clothes and her family and her phone and all of that, suddenly have whole different meaning, less importance in some ways, and the phone quite important. Um, so I think, yes, in that way, um, when you look at the news now, or when people look at the news after they've seen the show, it may be, I think I might have a bit more understanding now what that would feel like when everything you took for granted isn't anymore. And it happens to poor people and rich people alike. Poor people have less resources to build themselves up again. Yeah. At this play, it's aimed at like, uh, like my age group, so 13 to 16 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, when you're writing for young people, do you, is there any difference how you write for like, an older audience? Uh, yes, in a lot of ways. In, in the first and most significant way, I think you have to work slightly harder because you've got no lifetime's experience to draw on. There's no, there's no lot of echoes or memories and stuff I can rely on you guys for because we've only been around for 13 or 16 years. Um, so I have to bring more, if you like. Um, I'm also aware that audiences, even if you're sat in a school, um, you know, where you're, you've been told to be there, so you might not want to be there, um, can fidget, walk out, you know, read a book, do your phoning, whatever. That, that you're not necessarily um, as willing an audience as um, people who paid money to go and sit in a the theatre and spend their evening there with, with their friends or whatever and watch, watch the play. They've got an investment in liking it, if you like, because they, they've committed to doing it. So I've got to engage with the young audience right from the start and not let go right to the end. So I would probably write much shorter burst scenes than I would for um, adults. Um, and I would very often have um, a young protagonist. And if I was going to be having a narrator, somebody who was going to lead us in and give us information, that person would almost certainly be somebody around your age group, just because that's an initial, immediate link. Um, Multi-rolling is also something that's very positive about writing for young audiences, because I think anybody really likes it, I think young people do particularly watch actors strutting their stuff and actually going, I'm somebody else, I'm somebody else. How did they do that? You know, it's kind of exciting. Yeah. No more about you. Uh, what subjects did you enjoy at school? Drama, English, uh, the kind of ones you'd sort of expect, um, and history. So like most people, I think I enjoyed the subjects I was good at, which was mostly English and drama. So you were like top of the class in this one? No, I've never been top of the class in my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, when you were younger, who was your role model? Who did you look up to? You mean professionally, in terms of being a writer? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think the, the women playwrights I used to go and see were um, Bryony Lavery and Carol Churchill. And for the men, it was Arthur Miller um, and Alan Plater. Okay, and they were like your favourite, they were like your favourite writers? They were people whose writing I really, Brian Friel, that was the other one. Um, they were people who I, I used to say, in fact I did say it to Alan Plater when I met him once, um, I want to be you when I grow up. <laughs> I wanted to write like them. Okay. Um, when I'm older, I want to be a writer, so um, is there any advice you could give me? Write. Don't stop writing. Okay. Write all the time you can. Um, if you want to be a playwright, um, then um, read it out loud. Read it out loud anyway, actually, but if, you, if you're writing dialogue, get a group of friends, read it out, work with the drama group, work with other people and get them to test out how good your material is. Because when it's out in the world, when somebody's reading it and it's there and it's, it's heard, then you really get to be nailed as to how good it is or what needs to change. Mm -hmm. And the thing about drama is that it doesn't exist all on its own. A, a, a play that's just you know, within two covers that sits on a shelf, it doesn't mean anything. It requires actors and directors and designers and an audience. Mm. So you need to kind of put it out there. Um, thank you. I'm really looking forward to watching it when it comes to my school. Uh, thank you for your time.